thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, wow. I have been so fortunate uh, over the years to meet uh, people in my life as a, as a police officer and a detective um, who have become heroes to me. And those include uh, a group of individuals uh, that I've worked with for, for sometimes for many years, and those are, those are uh, child victims of sex crimes. And in our profession over the past 20 plus years that I've been a police officer, we've made some real progress in uh, working uh, with clinicians, with doctors, to make sure that our investigation and our response to sex crimes involving children is uh, trauma-informed and really cares about the kids. And yet, uh, thinking of a child um, victim of a sex crime and meeting them and interacting with them is still something that um, it's life-changing and uh, it's the most difficult work but also the most rewarding work that I've uh, been involved in. Having said all that, uh, we have here someone today that I just met today and uh, a new person that's become a hero of mine and that's Miss Irma Shaw. And uh, um, as I mentioned, the progress we've made over the past few decades uh, when Irma was 12 years old. In 1978, she was the victim of uh, a sex crime, uh, a heinous crime and uh, we're gonna tell you a little bit about this uh, very interesting and very terrifying story uh, right now. And Officer Joe Garrett from the U.S. Marshals Task Force is gonna uh, provide you some information and then I'll introduce you to uh, Irma. Hey folks, uh, yeah, Joe Garrett, uh, Grand Rapids officer, uh, signed the U.S. Marshal Fugitive Task Force. Thank you, Chief, appreciate you. Um, this case came to me in 2017. Um, the FBI had, had it before, prior to that. And uh, we ran a story then. Um, we got one tip, silent observer tip, um, at that point, uh, but not a lot of help on this. Um, the the pe person we're about to talk, to talk about is Tommy Lee Hill. Uh, back in the 60s, he began raping children, we believe. And then finally in 78, Irma came forward um, and brought to the attention of GRPD. We've got a timeline that you, you all are welcome to have, it has incident numbers on there, et cetera. Um, it was brought to our attention that Mr. Hill at that time was even raping children in Terre Haute uh, Prison in Indiana. Um, there are, there's documentation of that as well. Um, he was sent from Terre Haute back to GRPD. And it, nobody here is probably old enough to remember, uh, but back in 1979, he was getting sentenced for a Grand Rapids CSC um, involving Miss Shaw, Ms. Irma Major at the time though. Um, and he went into the, he needs, said he was thirsty, he went to the women's bathroom, um, and then from there uh, escaped the authorities at the courthouse during a sentencing out of Monroe Avenue, had a getaway car, and was um, gone for the foreseeable future. Uh, he was picked up in Mississippi and uh, resentenced back to Terre Haute. There was a, uh, a paperwork error, and uh, they let him go in Vigo, Indiana on a paperwork uh, mistake, um, never to be seen again by Grand Rapids authorities. Ms. Shaw here um, has worked with me, emailed me, texted me for seven years, and um, we were doing facial recognition stuff, social media stuff, um, finally caught a break. We got a genealogy trail that led us to Pittsburgh. I sent uh, Vanessa Robertson from the U.S. Marshal Service the information she gave me, an amazing um, analytic chart of nine contacts to make contact with in Pittsburgh. From there, Detective Knox and I did a boots down, um, boots on the ground, sort of blue collar uh, investigation. Um, we knocked on the door of six out of the nine contacts in Pittsburgh, and they, all of them had a similar sentiment of 40 years ago, recalling that this guy was not right, that he raped children, and they had all had similar stories about somebody in their family that he had molested or raped. Um, we finally met one contact um, who said, gave us a timeline. That this gentleman has changed his name to Abdullah Muhammad. He was a, a serial rapist. That, we, that led us to Pittsburgh PD on April 23rd. And we went down to the archives in the basement of the headquarters there. And this like 78 year old detective, just like you see in the movies with the gray hair suit, he, uh, he brings out a carton with a 
file for a man named Muhammad Abdullah. Um, and it, we, it was brought to our attention that this was a gentleman that had fled our authorities and that had raped so many of um, kids here in, in Grand Rapids back in the 70s and 80s. I shared those pictures with Miss Shaw and she confirmed that that was Tommy Lee Hill. He had changed his name and been living in Pittsburgh from about 1980 to 1983. Um, the, what, led us, uh, what happened in 1983 is he was shot in the back of the head, uh, December 4, 1983, by a man named Vernon Phipps after he had touched Vernon's sister. So he got his own um, level of street justice, it seems. Um, so that brought us um, to where we are now. Uh, if you have any questions for me, um, I'd happily field them. There are pictures on page 77 of her book um, uh, of Tommy Lee Hill, uh, AKA Abdullah Muhammad. Um, also, I have a pretty extensive knowledge of, of him and the things that he did. So if there, are, if there are questions for me, I can field them afterwards, but otherwise I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Irma Major Shaw. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Um, I really want to thank the Chief of Police. I want to thank Grand Rapids Police Department. I want to thank Officer um, Garrett. I want to thank the United States Marshal and anyone and everyone that have supported me through this 46-year journey. It has been a journey. Um, I was a kid then, but I stand here as a fully mature adult woman. Um, I'm holding my book because of um, the fact that Tommy had gotten away for so many years, uh, on my heart, I knew that if he was still alive, he would still be victimizing children. And because of social media, I um, thought that I would create and write my own book. And there was a $7,000 reward that was issued, which I thought would be an incentive to anyone to, um, if they knew where he was at, dead or alive, to be able to um, call and report it and remain silent. And so I wrote this book in 2018, looking for allies. But what is so unique is on page 75 of this book, I said, he can change his name, but what he can't change is his DNA. And what if he left the evidence many years ago before technology was created that would lead to the capture or the information about his death? And so I consider that to be very prophetic for me to have written that in 2018, as it was definitely part of the catalyst of why um, we are here today standing saying that 46 years, it may have taken us to um, really identify where he was, but the justice was served. And um, in a lot of ways, he did it to himself by helping us to um, be able to know where he was at. A family member has shared with me many years ago that they thought he was in Pittsburgh. They just didn't know the name that he was using. Um, in a lot of ways, I feel as though, um, I feel very grateful. I feel very grateful that I can go um, when that time comes to glory, but I will go with a level of knowing that this was resolved and it was closed. And even more importantly, I got introduced to a part of myself that I never knew existed. Because if you're someone who's lived with an unresolved issue since you were 12, I knew Irma as a 12-year-old kid. I didn't know Irma as a fully functional adult because so much of me was reserved to be able to uh, contact um, and be persevering with the marshals and the detectives and the police department. And so um, the fact that I got introduced to myself, I feel so grateful to be able to fully meet me and live a life where I no longer look over the back of my shoulders. And the reason that I did that is not only for myself, but because I knew the heart of this man would continue to victimize because of who he was. And so I was not only looking out for myself, but I was also thinking about those kids who may not have known who he truly was. So to know that he, he got justice and that fewer kids have been victimized by this man is something that I am eternally grateful for. I thank God for that. I thank God, not that he was murdered, because I really wanted to face him. I think um, Marshal <laughs> Officer Garrett had asked me, like, Irma, do you really think he's alive? I said, I know that he is, because something in my spirit is saying that he's looking for the day where he will face me. But unfortunately, it didn't turn out that way. But thank you for being here today. Just right off that point, you, you wish he was alive so you could have faced him. What would you have said in that moment if you had that opportunity? What I would have said, 
is when I was a child and I was weak, you were able to take advantage of me. But I'm no longer a victim here. I am triumphant because I've overcome this. And in many ways, my test, and that's what you put me through, is now my testimony. And so I get to utilize my experience to help other women and other children that have went through that. Mm -hmm. So you didn't win, you didn't win, and I am the victor. That's what I would have said. How old were you? 12, 12. And not only was I molested by um, Mr. Hill, I have to also tell you that I was impregnated by him. So I have a child that's buried in a cemetery because of him. So there's documentation of two for sure um, in, in Grand Rapids, and then there is documentation of two in Terre Haute and through the BOP. Um, and then the folks that we talked to in Pittsburgh, um, there were, it started to bring back some, some real hard feelings for some of the, the women that we talked to that were about Irma's age um, because of, they believe that three or four of the children out there were also um, molested or raped, but I asked them why they didn't come to the police and they said that's just something that they do back then. Um, the Vernon Phipps, the man who shot, ended up shooting Tommy on uh, December 4 of 83. Tommy had molested his sister, and he had just had enough. You said you were first uh, informed about this case in 2017 because of the Silent Observer tip. What exactly was that tip? So actually I was informed of it. Um, I was given it to, it was given to us from the FBI team. Uh, the U.S. Marshal Service adopted it. Um, I'm a, I should explain that. I'm a Grand Rapids officer. Um, I'm assigned to the U.S. Marshal Fugitive Task Force. Um, so we ran a story um, with Irma at that time and in hoping to generate SO tips. And I got one SO tip. It was interesting looking back. A female called and said, hey, that guy 40 years ago, I was broke down, or he was broke down on the side of, it, of I think, 80 towards, towards Pennsylvania. And I, I recognized that guy like it was Palpatine to her. So I mean, we were, she was on to something there, obviously. When you ran a news story, is that what you mean when you say you ran a story? Mm -hmm. okay. Correct. You said genealogy, and we've heard a lot of cases being broke open because of forensic genetic genealogy. Is this typical CODIS genealogy, or can you explain that? Yeah, I, some of the stuff that we deal with is really sensitive, and I can't give um, some of my, my sources that way, but you're absolutely onto the right thing. Obviously, in the 70s and 80s, there, there wasn't um, some of the APHIS, uh, some of the, the CODIS stuff that we have now. Um, so there was never any trail to him. In fact, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, he was fingerprinted after his death in, on December 5 of 1983, the day afterwards, and it came back no record. Obviously, he should have had a record through the BOP. Um, I just think that the AFIS system wasn't the, what it is now. When you talk about the paperwork issue, that, I mean, can you elaborate on what? Yeah, I, 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 so this is, this is all the paperwork I have on Tommy Lee Hill. Um, <laughs> In Vigo, in Vigo uh, County, Indiana, there was just a mistake. There was a clerical mistake, and he was supposed to come back, serve 20 to 40 years for rapes here in Grand Rapids County, and from Terre Haute, Indiana to there, there was just a, a disconnect, and I can't really expound on uh, what the clerical error was, because I was like two years old, but. <laughs> but I guess when you're, you're sitting here now, and all of you, I mean, for a while, we might have thought this guy could have still been on the loose, and now you know that you know he's been deceased for a while. I mean, what's the reaction now that he's dead, right? But, you know. Yeah. Um, fortunately, I think Irma and I agree that um, we're glad that he wasn't out raping more children. Um, I, 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 I joke that maybe they should have given Mr. Phipps the key to the city in Pittsburgh when that happened. But, um, you know, I, I think Irma can expound on that more. I think her breaking down and um, um, our, her, her raw reaction to when she found out about it. You know, um I think one of the values of us being here today is because other people are victims and sometimes it takes a long time in order for justice to be served. But I want victims to know that the Grand Rapids Police Department will continue to work for them. And even though their case may be different, is the fact that we've got a police department that works hard for um, its citizens. And also, um, I want to thank Mayor Bliss because we've got a mayor that supports the police department as well. And even for those who um, may be lacking hope, I, I was feeling hopeless, like I'll never get an answer. But with the change in technology, um, something that you couldn't have answered yesterday, tomorrow, 
may be able to be solved. And so I want to encourage uh, victims to know that there is hope and there could be justice. And so don't give up. Um, trust the Grand Rapids Police Department that they'll continue to work for you. And um, well, your, your day will come. Your day will come. What kind of closure did you have when you found out um, this man was passed away and, and that you weren't going to have an opportunity to face him in court? You know, I when I sat down and he said we caught him, I became very emotional because that morning I woke up. I am a widow right now, and so I'm going to get a little emotional right now because that day when I woke up, I told my daughter, I said, I feel like I'm going to my husband's funeral. It's the thing where you don't want to go, but you know you got to go. It's the meeting you don't want to attend, but there is no other time to attend. It's the thing you wish you could be dreaming about and that this was someone else's journey. But that day I knew that this was a step that I had to take. And it was actually a step that I had to take by myself. And so when I heard that information, I became very excited and emotional because at least there was an answer. And because I'm a realist, I asked myself this morning, Norma, what are you prepared for? There can only be three answers. We got him, we couldn't find him, or he's dead. Which of the three could you live with? The one that I couldn't live with is that we couldn't find him. The other two I was able to live with. So I was able to say that I'm free and I was able to live um, as I said, and get introduced, and I hadn't even thought about I would be introduced to a part of myself. So there was a lot of gratitude, very little disappointment. I wasn't disappointed that I wouldn't look him in the face because I knew the number of victims that, a number of people that was not victimized as a result of, of him, so. What would you have to say about the importance in continuing to pursue these cold cases 20, 30 years afterwards and being able to find some measure of closure for the victims? I would actually say, you know, that because the police department is uh, probably limited with funds, that if there's any way, if I could even start uh, a nonprofit to be able to allocate dollars for cold cases, that that would be something that probably would be beneficial because, of course, it comes down to dollars, comes down to resources, and um, and if there's a way that we can give them the resources, I think it would definitely be worth it. Um, I know that other victims would feel probably just like me, grateful, but even more importantly, they wouldn't, they would sleep better. They wouldn't have to look over their shoulders or worry about other people that may have come as a result of what they've encountered from, by the hands of, the, of, the perp of their perpetrator. What was the actual discovery made? The discovery that he was um, that he had passed. Yeah. Uh, so we drove out there on April 21st, April 22nd were, were, were the um, uh, investigations, um, and then April 23rd in the uh, headquarters of Pittsburgh PD. So April 23rd is the day that we just made the actual discovery. How did you discover that he changed his name? Um, the people that we had spoken to out there confirmed what the genealogy report said. Um, he had remarried a woman in 1980, 1981, that's a little bit unclear, and lived with her until 1983. That woman since passed two years ago, so that made it difficult because we couldn't talk to her. For clarification, is it Abdul Muhammad or Muhammad Abdul? Well, <laughs> um, he has four names, he had four names, four social security numbers, and he, he varied this last name with the spelling. It's Abdullah Muhammad on his death certificate, but he would spell it with the N, sometimes without an N, Abdullah Muhammad, and I can get you all the, the clarification on that. Had he been alive, would there have even been a trial? Like, is there a statute of limitations on that? Uh, he was already sentenced, so he, he, the warrant was still in lien, NCIC, um, so he would have served out the rest of his, his prison sentence. You know. How often are you tracking cold cases that don't involve homicide? I feel like that's typically what that's fair. Um, you know, the department was actually very gracious. I've, I've been a proponent of getting boots down on the ground in other cities um, because it's more palpable, I think, to us when, when the case is our baby and instead of just sending a lead out. And they were, they were really gracious in this, in this case. So uh, we, we do have cold cases. I have cases from 10, 15 years ago on my desk. Mm -hmm. How much does it cost to go through that genealogy process? 
Uh, I I don't know the raw numbers on that. I would just not be. I don't know, Chief, if you would. stuck in that limbo for whether it's two months or 20 years. Yeah, and I think that's where how Irma probably felt. We stay in contact together and it's it's so hard. Um, I can only imagine. I read I read every police report of every victim of, of every uh, criminal sexual conduct fugitive that I have. And, um, you know, it brings it sometimes brings tears to your eyes on how these kids are abused. Um, so I can only imagine how they feel wondering if the police or law enforcement or U.S. Marshal Service is looking for that's that fugitive that harmed their child. Um, it's very hard, it's hard as an investigator too, but we try to keep in contact with them um, and, and try to keep them abreast on the, on the process. And can I add something? Absolutely. I think that it's really important that even as a victim that you, if you can, um, if you've got the scope um, or the capacity to be your greatest advocate, I know that I felt sometimes like I was being a bother um, because I'm like, hey, we get any more information? Hey, it's been 30 days, it's been a year, right? But I, I stayed, I kept a part of me um, reserved for the journey and so that I wouldn't give up and so that they would remember me. Um, and so then I did one step further and wrote my own book. Not only did I write my own book, I did audio book. I self-published it on Amazon because I put a picture of this man in there and um, I wanted people to be able to see it. So if there's a person out there that's been a victim and they've got that person's name, I, you know, social media is a great platform. I would use that as much as they can. Like I said, it's depending on the capacity of the person because I know that everybody is not like me, but I believe that they may have somebody like me in their life um, that could be that person to take it to another level to help them to help the police department. Was there any moment where you did consider, like, man, we've been going at this for so long, is it even worth it at this point? No, there was never that moment. Um, but because I'm a widow um, and because so many of my family members are deceased, I just was pushing that it would happen in my lifetime, that I would be alive to see it. So as long as I had breath in my body, my goal was to stay at it, right? As long as I had air in my body until somebody told me he was dead or where he was, I knew that I was the victim. So who else would be leading or be the champion if it wasn't me? Um, because they've got so many other cases and you know, limited resources, so I wanted to be, I was mindful of that. Just to get a number of, number of survivors and victims here, I mean, two in the Grand Rapids, two in Indiana, more in Pittsburgh, I mean, rough number, how many do you suspect overall here? I don't remember, what do you think? You, you know the family. <laughs> You know what, I, I've heard that even before me, 10 years even before me, that he was doing this to other members in this community. He's probably got 30 to 40 victims, and that's with the people that I know that knew him. Um, and, it, and it may not have just been molestation, it was um, domestic abuse, it was assault. Um, I think he was arrested somewhere between um, escaping here um, for assaulting somebody. So this man was very violent. Um, so it wasn't just criminal sexual conduct, it was victims as it relates. I got access to the Grand Rapids Press um, archives where I was able to Google his name and saw other things that he had done and other victims, so, you know. Is it weird to get so familiar with someone who um, assaulted you in that way? Because you're, you're obviously looking into him for different reasons, but you still get to have a, an interesting relationship with someone who caused you so much trauma? Well, you know, I've never looked at it that way, so that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, part of my passion is genealogy, and so with that passion comes learning about someone and learning probably more, thi more things than what they would want to share with you. And because I was trying to advocate for myself, I needed to learn as much about him as I could. So I was contacting relatives and for years I've been doing it. Have you heard from him? When is the last time you saw him? And 
one of his family members had told me, um, an extended family member, that they had seen him in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, maybe in early 90s or something, but they couldn't remember the name that he was using. So, you know, the familiar, familiarity came as a result of me just being diligent, but I've never looked at it as me becoming familiar versus I'm doing the work. You know, researching is what I do. So it just struck me when, when uh, the question came about total number of victims, and um, I don't think there's probably anybody in this room that really feels bad about uh, how Mr. Hill's life ended. Well, it's been called street justice, but I think it's important to keep in mind uh, the journey he took uh, here. All the victims that, uh, that he victimized here, um, this is tough for him. I don't know how you stand up here. And, uh, <laughs> uh, let, let me just uh, say, the beginning of the end of his count of victims was 12-year-old Irma going up in front of a jury, in front of a judge, in public, and testifying against this monster. And if it wasn't for 12-year-old Irma being a brave, uh, amazing 12-year-old, there's an excellent chance that we could be talking double or triple the number uh, of victims. So I want to thank, uh, I know Irma came up here and um, you're like a professional <laughs> at this. Um, uh, but this isn't easy to stand in front of you guys like this. But looking back in the 70s to have a 12 year old testifying against the man who raped her, uh, I'm just, a, a, just in awe of, of this woman and um, I described you as one of my heroes already and so thanks for coming today and um, thank you guys for, for covering it. We appreciate you. Jim, what are your thoughts on sort of, obviously when uh, this individual was released, before uh, you were probably even considering training to be a police officer, um, but how important is it to you to sort of rectify some of those mistakes from past departments, departments not even out of there, but I guess really to, how important is it to you to, I guess, do better? Extremely important, and especially in the field of uh, where we're talking about the, the most extreme crimes, murder, um, sexual assault against children. There wasn't uh, such a long time ago that the statute of limitations was such that if a child didn't uh, let us know by the time they were 22 or 23 that something had happened, even if they couldn't really uh, uh, come to terms with it until later, it was past the statute of limitations. There was nothing we could do. So the changes in law that, that are headed in the right direction, obviously the changes in technology. Uh, Joe talked about how even when this man died, they took his fingerprints and they ran it through the system once and they said, oh, he's clear. He was not, obviously was not clear. That was a fault in technology. DNA is something that's uh, changed the game as far as uh, policing is concerned. And so we always have to make sure that uh, we're doing better. And uh, the biggest example today that I can give is that we are able to provide some amount of closure to, to Irma. And that's what we want to do for, for everybody that's suffering like this. I want to ask a little more about this man's history. I mean, before you know, all the charges and convictions and the trials in this state, I mean, talk a bit about his background. How did he keep getting in this position and, you know, going after kids like this? Well, he was born into it. His, he's Tommy Lee Hill Jr. Tommy Lee Hill Sr. killed a police officer, actually. Um, so I'm not going to give him any sympathy or anything like that, but he was probably born into a rough situation. Um, and as far as the sexual assaults and, and Everything else, I think we've documented that. I do have a timeline for um, that's uh, available for all of you guys here. Um, but as far as uh, the CCH before that, uh, it's pretty long, extensive from assaults, rapes, and um, felonious assaults. Yeah, and I just want to say I can't uh, just emphasize enough how much uh, policing has changed with this sort of crime. That we are um, we're talking about something that. In the 70s, well, e even today, uh, it's estimated that over half of child sex crime cases or more go unreported, even. Um, so many victims, Tommy Lee Hill, and you know, one that came forward was willing to talk to the police. I'm sure she had to talk to the prosecutor. I'm sure she had to talk to the doctor. She had to do all these things, which now, in this day and age, we have, the, for example, the Kent County Children's Advocacy Center where the child comes and has one victim-sensitive inter interview, talks to one 
trained person on how to talk to children. That was not anywhere, that wasn't even anybody's thought at the time, I'm sure. Um, I mean, you're likely to walk into a police station and see somebody behind the desk smoking a cigarette and taking your report, and you want a, a child to go up and give information about a sex crime. Children weren't believed. A lot of time women in domestic violence situations weren't believed. This was so uncommon to have somebody with the strength, uh, with the fortitude to come forward and then to testify at, at a court like this. I'm telling you, Irma made all the difference in probably dozens of, of child's lives. As this man, after she stood up, after she, she did what she did, he was on the run. And I'm sure that was a game changer. And uh, yeah, I just can't say enough how impressed. It was a different world for child sex victims back in 1978, and uh, this is such a big deal. How did you, how did you know this, you know, that time you were so, so, how did this all happen? Are you asking me? Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, well, believe it or not, he was my stepfather. Oh. I knew him since I was three. I called him daddy because, um, he was the only father that lived in the house with me at the time that I was three. Him and my mother was married actually on her birthday. Um, but he was also uh, a player in my early childhood and um, in somewhat, I think, contributed to his escape because at that time the detective, um, I think she was a family worker um, when I was removed from my mother's care because he wasn't married to my mother. And back in 1968, I think there was some laws that says my mother is a married woman who's living with a man who's got an illegitimate child, but she's married to another man. So we were removed from her custody until she divorced my birth father and married him. And so he became um, familiar with the person who later became a detective um, when he escaped. And so that familiarity with my family, I think, came as a result of when I was three years old, and the, the, moral, the moral standards of conduct was a factor um, then. You would be kind of panicked for most of your life, wouldn't you, thinking he's gonna come after you? I didn't panic, um, be, but I, I knew what he looked like, and I remembered, so I, you know, even if I traveled abroad, I would look, you know, no, if I went to Chicago, Detroit, anywhere, you know, um, I even moved to Phoenix, relocated to Phoenix. But even in Phoenix, you know, I looked for him. I looked for him everywhere I was at because he was someone I was familiar with. And um, he was someone who had a 20 to 40 year sentence with my name on it. You know, as far as the oh. account you go, go sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had, a, like I said, we had a U.S. Marshal Analyst, um, Vanessa Robertson. She, she deserves a, a lot of this credit. I asked her if I could use your name. Um, really, the two catalysts were Irma and, um, and, and her. She gave us those nine contacts to talk to in Pittsburgh. And, uh, we even had the local police called on us on one of the contacts. They, didn't. <laughs> oh, really? they were kind of concerned why Grand Rapids police officers would be there, but uh, we, we got six of them to talk to us pretty well. appreciate you guys taking the time to, to cover this today. And one last thing, if I oh. could say anything. Um, you know, this is a book about hope. Um, if it's okay with you, I would like to read my, um, I would like to read something. Most people like stories, this is my prologue, and prefer fables, but rarely want the truth. I am aware that everyone cannot handle candor. As for myself, I prefer reality over lies and deception. This autobiography will be unlike any other that you have read, and that is deliberate because my life has been an extraordinary journey. I have written my story to encourage others that have struggled or currently struggling in similar situations. My hope and prayer are that you will be informed and enlightened, no matter how difficult it is to stand in the fullness of your truth and one day find strength to inspire others. I want to express a thank you, a special thank you, to Richard for his contributions to this project. 
Our chemistry and collaboration are intertwined throughout this book. He encouraged me to take people along your journey and feel freely and freely express feelings and emotions. And so um, I hope that someone will feel encouraged. I hope that if you're looking for a way to uh, support me, if, if that's what you want to do, prayers I can always accept. But the best um, way to support me is by telling your truth writing your own story, and if you've been a victim, to call the police. If you know someone who's been a victim, especially of childhood molestation, that you would call and that you would be the person that would advocate to bring um, justice for that victim. So thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.